1933, probably the bleakest year of the Great Depression, a new crop of superheroes emerged. They didn't have superhuman powers, but they did have the diligence and commitment to hone their natural gifts in extraordinary ways, self-fashioning themselves into people who might just save your life and people you'd want in the wings and on your side in the deeply troubled times of 1933. For in that year, hope was the scarcest commodity of all. But every month you could immerse yourself in Doc Savage as he triumphed over adversaries more challenging than your own and did so through discipline and self-improvement. He was fighting for you. And if you got in real trouble, and trouble was all around, there was Perry Mason who, like Doc Savage, first emerged in 1933. He wasn't anything like your local or family attorney at all. If you hired him, he would fight for you with the tenacity, even savagery, utterly different from your usual lawyer. As much a detective as an attorney, he was willing to fight dirty and skirt every law simply to allow you to walk free. Again, a perfect hero for troubled times. In the very first chapter of the first Perry Mason book, he lays it out clearly. Perry Mason smiled at her. Slowly, he got to his feet, put his hands on the edge of the desk, and leaned his weight on them so that his body was leaning toward her across the desk. Yes, he said, I know most of the attorneys that you've consulted have had expensive suites of offices and a lot of clerks running in and out. You've paid them big money and haven't had much to show for it. They've bowed and scraped when you came in the room and charged you big retainers, but when you get in a real jam, you don't dare go to them. Her wide eyes narrowed somewhat. For two or three seconds, they stared at each other, and then the woman lowered her eyes. Perry Mason continued to speak slowly and forcefully, yet without raising his voice. All right, he said. I'm different. I get my business because I fight for it, and because I fight for my clients. Nobody ever called on me to organize a corporation, and I've never yet probated an estate. I haven't drawn up over a dozen contracts in my life, and I wouldn't know how to go about foreclosing a mortgage. People that come to me don't come to me because they like the look of my eyes or the way my office is furnished or because they've known me at a club. They come to me because they need me. They come to me because they want to hire me for what I do. She looked up at him. then. Just what is it that you do, Mr. Mason, she asked. He snapped out two words at her. I fight. After the case of the Velvet Clause in 1933, Earl Stanley Gardner wrote another Perry Mason that year and for the next decades would crank out several Perry Masons every year. And readers could come to the books with lives messed up in awful, awful ways, but never quite as bad as the clients of Perry Mason and somehow through his detective work and his tenacity and his bending of the rules and his willingness to really be a prize fighter on behalf of the client, they would find the mess of their lives resolved. And I think it was a perfect formula for troubled times. And um, it's not accidental, I think, that 1933, the grimmest year of the Great Depression, gave birth to both resourceful Perry Mason and resourceful Doc Savage. But for now, let's take a visual celebration of the world of Perry Mason since the stories inspired really terrific work on the part of cover artists.
Thank you for watching. If you like this, please like and subscribe.